Okay, so let, let's get started. Um, who starts? You, you, Ricardo. So it's, it's you first. Okay. Yeah, I volunteer for the first uh, lab on the validation uh, approach. So let's see how we can do this. Uh, okay, share screen. Okay, here we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, so this is, right, uh, chapter five. Uh, we're going to do the first lab of the cross validation and the bootstrap, which is the, the title of the, I, I believe, of the, the chapter. And I found this uh, uh, a model, let's put it that way, this model that tells you basically the core of why you want to you know, split your data set into usually a training and a test set, okay? And we have to go back to chapter two. In chapter two, you, you were talking about certain concepts called bias, variance, how the model can underfit or overfit. So the reason why we split uh, the data set in two sections, usually training and test, is to work on the training set, right? Okay, our models are going to work on the training set, optimizing that training set, but then you're going to apply it eventually to the test data set, that portion that you left untouched, okay, that the, that the model is not seeing right now, so that then you can see how well that model that you train in the, optimizing the training set can generalize in unseen data. And basically, that's what this uh, framework tells you in, in a graphic way. Of course, there's a middle section there, right? It's called validation, right? And when we talk about validation, K4 validation, et cetera, we add a certain portion of that training set. We spare it so we can then compare within the optimization process, the tuning process, we can compare that section with the rest of the, you know, of, of the model. So in fact, what we're doing is a training data, a validation data, which is within the training data, but then in the test data is the one that is unseen, is the new data that we're going to use then to see how well our model is generalizing. The key word, of course, is generalized. You want generalized models. In other words, you don't want models that are very tied to that training data set because then what is going to happen is that you are very good at the training uh, data set, but then in the test data set, the non-seen data set, they're going to do poorly, okay? So you have to you know, juggle this uh, balance between optimizing and then trying to get a good measure, a good metric in that test data set. And any questions so far? Because basically that's, this, is the, you know, this is the foundation. Of, of this chapter and also of the, of, of the exercises that we're going to do. Good? Okay, so let's do then some, some science here. So I'm going to you know, uh, go step-by-step step, uh, through the lab, but also I'm going to use the source from Emil, uh, uh, for, you know, using the tidy models, because then, you know, you can learn both, right? You can learn the theory, but also you can learn how to apply it and, you know, work with the tidy models. So the first thing is that we're going to upload, right, the, the tidy models. We're going to upload also the data. It's, it's in the uh, ISLR library. And it's the data of, uh, you know, cars, uh, uh, some cars uh, data, MPGs, horsepower, et cetera, that we have been uh, seeing in this chapter in the theory part. Then we're going to load, right? Sorry. We're going to load the, the data set and we're going to do what is called a splitting. 
that's the first part that you're going to do with your data set. Once you have your data set, you know, in order, clean and uh, explore, for example, you know, you should know if there's any outliers, if there's any missing data, okay? We're assuming that you did all that, okay? That's, a, and that's another, you know, that's another topic, really. You have that clean data set, okay? Everything in order. And what you're going to do is that you're going to use this function in the tidy models called initial split. It comes from the resample uh, a package, okay? And what we're going to do is that you're going to split it. You're going to split some of the observations, some of the records are going to go to the training, and then some of them are going to go to the test. And the proportion, you can check the proportion here, right? 0 0.5, we're going to divide it in half, you know, to follow the, the lab. And very important, something that usually you don't see it in base R that tidy models incorporate is what is called the strata, the straight uh, argument, okay? And this one uh, has a, a nice feature because depending on which is the uh, feature that you're going to be stratifying, what it does is that if the feature, let's say it's a, it's a continuous uh, feature like MPG, miles per gun, right? You can fluctuate from 10, 11, 20, 30, 40, whatever. So you have a distribution. So what is going to do that strata, strata uh, argument is to divide that distribution equally. So you'll have an equal distribution in the training set as in the test set, okay? In other words, they're not going to be that unbalanced, okay? It's kind of, it's kind of balancing that distribution, that frequency of that, uh, of that feature. If it's a categorical, then what it does is that the counts, okay? The counts, the frequency of the labels, they're going to be very similar in the training and the test set. So you don't have any bias in that particular feature from the training and the data set and the test data set, okay? So it's an, it's an important feature, uh, the, the strata thing. So be, be, be aware of that. And sometimes you have to figure out which one because in this uh, particular example, we're taking the response, right? The MPG, that's the, that's the feature that we're going to try to predict. But sometimes you want to stratify your data set with a particular feature that you want to incorporate, you know, in your training and your test equally uniformly. Okay, so be be aware of that. So this is the output, right? Uh, we have three hundred and ninety-two uh, observations, uh, records, rows, and then the training is going to have one ninety-four, and the test is going to have one ninety-eight. Okay, uh, it's supposed to be one ninety-six, right? But apparently, you know, the model in this particular way, because of this distribution of the stratification, that it decided, okay, let's put 194 and 198, but it's closer to the, to the half. Then the second part is then when we have the splits, okay, that, that split object, auto split, then we're going to be uh, creating our training and test set with the commands training and testing, okay, that come also from the R sound. Okay, so everyone with me right now? Good. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, so this is just, you know, to look at your, uh, at your training and test the data set. Okay, so as you can see, you, you, uh, we have uh, the MPG, right? If you, you know, I, I didn't do it, but if you want to graph it, you will see that the MPG distribution is going to be very similar in the training and the testing set. And also we have different features, cylinder, displacement, horsepower. We're going to be using this uh, horsepower as our predictor for the MPG, just to make it you know, simple. And we're going to use our old friend from chapter three, uh, the linear regression model, but now in tidy models. So here we are, and we're going to model as I said, the MPG by the horsepower using a simple linear regression, in other words, the OLS, the ordinary uh, least square uh, regression model. So this is the spec, okay? So 
Uh, the first component is the linear, linear uh, underscore reg, which is the object from the tidy models, in fact, from the parsnip package. Then for that, you set the mode, which is regression. Okay, it could be regression or classification if you're doing a uh, you know a categorical variable as response. Then you do classification. But here, MPG is a continuous, so we're going to do the regression. And this engine is going to be our old friend LM. Okay, the linear model. Okay. So once we have the spec, what we're going to do is fit the model, right? So what the fit, we're going to use the spec that we that we did, the regression and the and the engine. And then we're going to use fit, uh, the, the fit uh, command. And we're going to say, okay, you're going to fit that. LN spec with MPG as a response and horsepower as a predictor. And the data that you're going to use is auto train. In other words, our training set, because that's the one that we want to be working. Then once you fit, you're going to use the augment uh, function from the broom package, right? And you're going to then apply, you already, the LM fit or at least is the object that you have all the parameters from the model that you train in, in the training set. Then you're going to use the augment to then use that testing set, the testing data set to then apply it to the model and see how well are we doing. Uh, with the JARstick uh, model, which is, you know, the one with the metrics, uh, you can then calculate the RMSA, root mean square error, okay? One of the metrics that we can use in regression. And we're going to uh, check, uh, you know, give the parameters of the actual values, the truth, actual values, and then the estimate, which is inside this feature called dot pre. Okay, those are the predictions. So this compact uh, statement does everything. It does the predict, it does the metrics, et cetera. And the result is that the RMSE for that particular model is 5.06. By itself, it doesn't tell you that much, uh, you know, that, that number, because you are probably thinking, but is it good or is it bad? You know, how, how am I doing? So what I'm going to do is compare it with the auto train, do the same function of the LM fit, the augment, and the metrics with the training set to see how far or how close are we. If we are close in the metric, that means that our model is generalized. If you are too far, and it depends on you know what is far, let's say, you know, maybe you you know you, you have like 10, 20, 30 percent. Okay. So how far you are, then that means that your model could be overfit. In other words, it's getting some noise from that horsepower predictor that is not helping you generalize in your, uh, you know, in, 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 in your data. So in this case, the RMSAE for the training is 4.04, .04, okay? So uh, you can do a simple calculation, right? You know, just, uh, subtract the 5.06 by the 4.04 .04, and then divide it by that same number, 4.04, .04, and you'll give you some percentage. Okay. I'm going to do it right now, you know, with you. Uh, let, let's see how, you know, what, what is the percentage of more or less, you know, how we can, how we can deal with. It. Okay. So 5.06 minus 4.04 .04 divided by 4.04. .04. It's four. four. It's four point seven four. Four point four. Yes. Okay. So I don't know if you can see it here. Okay. Uh, it's about six percent. Six point seven percent. Okay. You can you you can double double check that number. So what what it means in this particular and remember one thing that is very important also is that uh, remember this before the the split. Uh, we did the seeding, right? Okay, the seeding is what tells, okay, this is the list of random numbers that the model is going to be using. 
and it's used for reproducibility. If we change this number, okay, let's say set C to 10, uh, the metrics are going to change, okay, because the list of random numbers is going to change too, okay, so be, be aware of that one. That's why you do, usually you do, in these models, you do cross-validation, okay, that you pick different, you know, uh, uh, selections within the training set to avoid, you know, being biased to one particular list of random numbers, okay, so be, be, be aware of that. So what, what do you think? Do you think that the model is generalizing with that number, 6%, 6.7? Let, let, let's uh, let's uh, round it up to 7%. Do you think it's a good model? It's a bad model? It's okay? Can be improved? Sure, it can what be do you improved. Think? Yeah, can be improved. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely, it can, it can be improved, right? Okay. But it is not that it's not that far apart, right? I mean, you know, it it, it, dep it depends on the you know the situation. Maybe if you are trying to get you know closer to let's say a, a parameter of five percent, you know, as your stated goal, you know, in this that I, I'm going to you know my, my training and my test is going to be five percent, then seven percent is going to be a little bit a little bit off. So you have to be aware of how, and this is more an art than really science, okay? Because this is more your intuition and your domain knowledge of what is going on here, okay? So let's see if we can improve the model, right? So let's uh, try to do something called the poly, uh, the polynomial uh, regression. That was also, uh, we discussed some of that theory in chapter three. So to do that in tidy models, uh, we're going to do the step, which is part of the recipes uh, package, the step underscore poly, okay? So what it does is that it adds a polynomial, you know, feature, feature to, the, to the predictor. In this case, we're going to do a polynomial with degree two. In other words, you know, like a quadratic uh, uh, formula, okay? And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to establish a recipe, okay? Like we did with the fit, uh, we're going to do the MPG uh, predicted by the horsepower with the data of the auto train. Then we're going to do a workflow, right? Because we're because we're incorporating that recipe step underscore poly. Then we need to do a workflow as you know the tidy models highly recommend. We're going to add to the workflow the poly uh, recipe, and then we're going to add the model. And you have your workflow here. Okay, then the next step is fit, right? We're going to fit that workflow, the training, the, the, the data, set, the training data set. And we're going, it's going to give us this object, poly fit. It's going to, you know, have all the parameters of that uh, uh, model uh, using the training data set. And the same thing. The, the good thing about tidy models is that, you know, when you get the recipe working, you just have to repeat, it, okay? You just have to change some of the parameters and then, you know, you repeat it. So it's very uniform, okay? And, you know, it saves a lot of time, of course. So when you fit, you're going to apply the augment, right? The augment for the new testing data set uh, to, you know, to apply the model to the testing data set and check the metrics. And now the metrics, it was 4.37, okay? Big improvement, right? From 5.06 to 4.37. We're talking the orders of probably a 20% uh, improvement right, right there, okay? Difference and then, you know, divide. So what, what is going on? Why our linear model was giving us a higher um, root mean square than this model? And if we visualize what's happening, okay, we plot the horsepower uh, and the MPG uh, with a scatter plot, and then we apply what is called a low S, which is a local polynomial, okay? It's a, it's a quadratic formula that is applying, you know, to do the best fit in that formula. You see that the tendency of those uh, scatter points is not aligned. Okay, it's more like a curve, okay? So 
if you have less horsepower, it's going, the car is going to give you more miles per gallon. And that's, you know, traditionally, that's what you expect. Then if you have more horsepower, more capacity on the engine, then you get less uh, miles per gallon. The problem is that the relationship really, uh, you know, visually is not linear, okay? So that's one of the things that the linear model cannot account for. In other words, because the linear model assumes, and we go to the assumptions, assumes that the relationship that is underlying horsepower and miles per gallon is linear, it cannot do anything else, okay? So my questions for, for, for you guys is, is the linear model, you know, trying to fit this, this uh, scenario here, is that an example of bias or variance? What do you think? Uh, that's bias. a good question. That's a good question for uh, uh, who said bias? Uh, Jenny. Jenny, uh, you are correct. Okay, and I had to look. Uh, I had to look for. Okay, just to make sure that you know it, it was correct. But you you are correct. This is an example of bias. Mm -hmm. You are using a model to predict a you know a, a scenario that the assumption of the linear model is not being. Uh, you know, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't pan out, okay? Exactly. Because the relationship between horsepower and MPG, as we clearly can, can see, is nonlinear, okay? Mm -hmm. That's why the polynomial is doing a better job uh, at, at, you know, fitting, fitting those points than the linear model. So that's an example of a bias, okay? Aha, uh -huh. go, go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh Aha. -huh. <laughs> um... Okay, so do do we can we can we stop here with this and uh, sure. uh, uh, let yeah. Jenny uh, yeah. do the other bit? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, there's just one, one one more slide and and that's it. Okay, and it's just you know trying to give you a, you know a, a different estimate you know for this, but this is basically you no. Know, the end. <laughs> okay, Jenny, take it on. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. Share screen. Um, all right, so um, so I tried to use the tidy models as well as some of the base R. Um, that was actually just in the R for data science uh, GitHub. And OK, so I did the validation set. Um, again, yeah, I so did some data exploration here, just plotted um, the uh, horsepower and miles per gallon. And you could immediately see that it was not um, particularly linearly um, related. Uh, I just had fun there. Um, let's see. So I went through that. Anybody else? Um, do, do, do. I actually just tried to. So for the polynomial regression, I was trying to understand why. Um, it might make it a better model. So I just kind of like threw up um, quadratic of the miles per gallon. And, and I do think I see, you know, like you can kind of see the data points fit a little bit closer. So maybe that makes sense why it's a better model fit to include that as a term in the model. Um, and then here I did the cubic and I don't know, maybe not as bad, that is good. Um, so I checked some of the residuals in the fitted. So you can see here um, the LM fit. Uh, so that's just the linear regression. Um, and you can see that there is not, th there is some kind of bias in the residuals versus the fitted, right? It's not like this even distribution um, that you would wanna see. So it kind of tells you probably wasn't a linear relationship. Um, 
QQ plot, uh, same thing, got some kind of like deviance over here. Um, okay. And then if we look at the polyfit, um, we see a much even, much more even distribution of the residuals, which tells us that maybe it's a better model fit. Um, but again, still not normally distributed because, well, it's it's not a normal distribution. Um, and okay, so then I did k-fold cross-validation. So this is a method where instead of just doing two splits, you will actually do any number from one to k. Um, and uh, so oftentimes five and 10 are the ones that are, are determined, um, obviously depending on the size of your input data set, um, because you don't want your training uh, data to be too small. Um, and so essentially what we do here is, uh, so we're gonna create a tuned recipe. Uh, so I'm still, this is my first time really using tidy models. So I'm still kind of trying to understand. So the recipe basically just says, okay, we're gonna be running this formula over and over again using this data set. Um, it tells us that we are going to be using different uh, polynomials. Um, so different power, um, to our, our horsepower here. And then we kind of just put this placeholder tune function so that we don't actually have to put in the specific degree because that's what we're gonna be testing. Um, so then uh, essentially we create the specification um, where we say we're gonna do linear regression using the model LM, the engine LM, which is probably just like the stats built-in LM function. Um, and then uh, we create a workflow, right? So this is what we're gonna do over and over again using our recipe, so the polytuned, right? Um, and we're gonna be running this, um, this formula using the engine LM for our degree. Um, then we go back to our data and we just say, all right, we want to, um, oh, maybe that should have just been all of auto. Huh, I just realized that's probably, okay. Anyways, auto folds. Um, so then basically um, we want to just split our data into 10 parts. Um, and so here we have V equals 10. Um, now that I think about it, it actually could have been useful to put a little figure in here, but it's basically literally just five non-overlapping segments of our data set. I mean, excuse me, 10 non-overlapping segments of our data set. Um, so then we use this grid regular. So this provides us with a range of values that we are gonna use for a polynomial degree. So here, so it's just really simple, probably even in the book, they kind of said like, it's a little bit overkill to use something like this um, grid regular, but just so that you're aware that that function exists, they had us use it. Um, so then tune grid will fit the models within each fold. So here we actually just use one, one call. We look at our workflow for the tuned uh, workflow. And then we use our auto folds, which is all of our segments of our original training data. And then we say fit you know, our degree grid. So anything from one to 10 for our degree. Then we can look at the tune res. Again, here we have X number of uh, our folds. Um, we can collect our metrics here. So in this case, uh, oh, I didn't print it out, but uh, but it shows all of the, uh, I think, um, mean squared error, but, but yeah. So then we have the show best. So basically we look at our, um, our different polynomials, one through 10. And it has our root mean squared error here. And then for the degree of the polynomial, and then you can see here, essentially um, the second polynomial is the best um, because it has the lowest standard error. Um, okay. And then like, so we calculate the root mean squared error for every single fold. Um, so we did this 10 times. So we fit our model 10 times. 
within for each of the 10 degrees and uh, then we just get the average of our root mean squared error for each of the models that we fit within polynomial degree two and so that gives us our mean here so our root mean square error is 4.35 after using the cv um, approach uh, and then also there's kind of these nice useful uh, functions built into tiny models uh, which is um, so for example here tune res we just say just give us the best one by using root mean squared error and it says okay well that's your uh, second degree um, so then we do the final work, uh, final workflow. So we finalize the workflow. Um, so we put in our polytuned workflow object. We say, okay, we have the best degree based on root mean square error. Um, and then it, it actually just, I guess that's our final. Oh, and then we go. <laughs> so this gives us our final workflow. And honestly, I'm not sure what this abstraction is. And then we have our final fit on the auto train data. And that is, um, I don't know if anyone can explain why we do finalize workflow. I kind of should have pushed in that when I was going through it, but. Danny, Danny I, can, I, I can give you some help there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've been watching a couple of Julia uh, Silly. <laughs> oh yeah, and I need to get there. Yes, I have it like bookmarked. It pinpoints very clearly, you have to do the fitting, okay? After you tune your model, Mm -hmm. That'll do the fitting on the whole, you know, data set on the whole training data set again, you know, to incorporate those parameters that you, you know, you selected, mm -hmm. and then the final fit is, you know, to get get that testing data set, so you can then compare, uh, in the final version, you can then compare how well, you know, the training is generalizing to the test. I okay? see. Okay. That's the purpose of this whole, you know, uh, whole, whole instructions. Yeah, uh, so too. You know, once you get the, the parameters, right? You know, yeah. you get your tuning parameters. Then you yeah. have to apply that particular model with the tuning parameters. You have to apply it to the, you know, to the to the to the training uh, yeah, data true. set because you haven't done it uh, yet. You have used the training set to optimize, but you haven't applied it yet. So once you apply it, that's mm -hmm. the that's the that, that that's the finalized uh, workflow, really. Okay, finalized workflow. Mm -hmm. Then the final fit is incorporating that split that you did. Yeah. You know, at the beginning, that split mm -hmm. incorporate the testing, the testing data set. And then now you can compare. Okay. Okay. That that was very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I see. Okay. I, I mean, it took, it, it took a while, you know, to, to get the gist, but I said, okay. Yeah. Now, I, it, it, clicks, it clicks. It clicks. <laughs> yeah, this is helpful because as I'm running it, I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, of course. Like, I'll finalize the workflow. And now I'm like looking at it. I'm like, why did I? <laughs> Tell you, what, what, what am I doing? You know, I, I'm already done, you know? I'm already done. Come on, you know? Why do you have to do this? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. So, yeah. Um, so then I, I just did it using Base R. This was based on the R for data science, um, just the GitHub. That was nice. Um, so, here, this is actually leave one out cross validation. Um, and so we just did that because that is um, the default in the cv.glm. Um, and so again, we just did a for loop. We fit um, 10 degrees, one through 10 for the degree on the polynomial um, using the whole data set. Um, and then again, we did chi fold cross validation. In this case, um, actually, hang on. K equals 10, oh, there it is. Okay, K equals 10. Okay, um, and so what this is gonna do here in CVJLM, it's going to fit the 10 models for the polynomial degree one through 10. Um, and then it's gonna calculate the mean RMSC um, across those 10 models to give us an idea of the test error. Um, and then the CV data frame here, it's just the results. So we just created a data frame um, that has the polynomial degree. And then we have the two models. So CV error is uh, the leave one out. CV error 10 is the K fold uh, 10 um, modeling procedure. Uh, and then we do the visualize the root mean squared error. Um, and then here, I just use auto plot on the tune res. Um, just to see how our 
polynomials um, affect the root mean square error auto plot has been very nice, but um, yeah, so it's kind of fun trying to figure out what works with auto plot because I kind of just keep throwing in all the tidy model objects into it and seeing what happens. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so we can actually see the polynomial degree here, and um, so we have our root mean squared error. It's fairly high here at the first degree, and then it significantly drops for the second, uh, and then we really don't get any benefit from increasing the complexity of the model. So probably a bad choice to do so. Um, if you're not getting a benefit, why would you do that? Um, and so then ggplot uh, of the CV data frame using base R. Um, so in this case, again, we see the very similar thing. Um, well, they don't have, they actually use mean squared error rather than root mean squared error. Um, so maybe I should have gone back and, and made it root mean um, squared error. So that would have been comparable. Um, but uh, essentially, again, just looking at the pattern, you can see at the first degree, it's quite high. Um, and then it significantly drops at the second degree um, and, and very little benefit, three, four, and then actually gets um, progressively, uh, well, I, you know, huh. The leaf one out actually seems to suggest, but probably wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so again, we see it increasing at three and four just slightly. So you probably don't want to go past two. So you would select two as your polynomial degree to include in your model. Um, so then the bootstrap, I'm not going to do the bootstrap unless if, I mean, I didn't, but yeah, so that was the K-fold cross-validation. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting that tidy models is I mean, they admittedly call themselves opinionated, um, but they were very anti leave one out cross validation. I have was kind of surprised at that um, because when I was watching the videos for the ISLR um, book um, for their, their lectures, um, you know, they actually seem to be quite in favor of leave one out cross validation. Um, I mean, yes, the models are highly uh, correlated, which can be a problem. Um, but I, they had made some kind of the original authors, Tiprashani and who's the other one, um, the, the German one, <laughs> um, he, they both basically been very much in favor of leave one out cross validation as being actually pretty computationally, like not intense. Um, and and I felt like tidy models was was just very strongly like don't ever use we don't support leave one out cross validation so I'm wondering if anybody has an idea on that um, or like why you would also kind of agree or disagree. You have to go ahead Jim. I, just just the thought when time is money you you go straight for the thing that. Um, um, you know, get, get you where you need to go. I, I guess the argument that leave one out. So for a sizable data set where you've got thousands of um, mm -hmm. observations, it okay. eventually is computationally intensive. Yeah. And if you can get away with tenfold, um, then, then you do that. Okay, that makes sense. My, my thoughts are exactly, you know, for this particular set, which only has 292 observations, uh, you know, you can you 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 can do the the one leave out right, you know, the leave one out uh, validation because it's not going to take that much time. Mm -hmm. But think about millions of rows, okay? I mean, it, it's going to take a while, mm -hmm. and probably the cross validation, you know, with just splitting uh, it in ten, it would approximate, you know, the results of the mm -hmm. of the leave one out. That's very so, uh, you know, it's, if, it, it depends on the situation that you are. Uh, if you have a, a data set that you can, you know, you can do this, fine, go ahead. But usually when you are talking about big data sets, uh, you have to, you know, think, think about how you're going to spend your time, you know, mm -hmm. doing this, this kind of uh, optimizations. Mm, certainly. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> if, if I had a data set that was, 200 points like this, um, it almost be inclined to go over to do um, 
something in Bayesian world with uh, mixed effects so I could take advantage of other things I know about hierarchies, um, which gets outside of the chapter content here, but um, it just, there's so few points, right? Just 200. Um, Also, also you can you could do a bootstrap, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The other part yeah. of the chapter. Right. You can do exactly. bootstrapping, and, and in fact, Bayesian incorporates you know uh, yeah. the, the bootstrapping you know uh, thinking because what it's doing is creating random numbers based on the data set you know simulations. Okay. I I, I think that's where I go would be some sort yeah. of mixed effects model. Yeah. That right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is a good candidate for bootstrapping, definitely, because uh, you know, less than four hundred observations, it's you know, it's a small, it's a small data set, and yeah. sometimes you are going to have to work with those. For example, in the prey that was working one, uh, the most that we got were eight hundred uh, observations. Yeah. Okay, one hundred observations, so we had to work with them. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, <laughs> working with the. Uh rare diseases as well, you're gonna be in a scenario where you're always gonna be limited. Yeah. Um, exactly. Number of samples. Uh, yeah. Sur that surveys. Also su surveys, you know, when you're doing surveys, yeah. you know, you get just a small, you know, sample. Usually. Yeah. There's things with uh, with a Poisson distribution that are, that are, you know, number one through 10 and, right. and that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So things that are not normally distributed, um, mm -hmm. bootstrapping is a, is, is a great approach. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, um, yep. Yeah. Uh, what happened to Federica? <laughs> oh. Okay, she's, she's, she's back. <laughs> oh, fearless leader. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're already missing you, man. <laughs> I, my goodness. Action. So I've, okay. I've lost a few, few lines. That's fine. <laughs> We're talking about bootstrapping. <laughs> uh, okay, I know that uh, we need to go. We have a few minutes left. So I, I don't know uh, when you were saying something, something, I don't know. Um, otherwise, um, I'll share just, um, just for you, for your knowledge a bit of this. Uh, yeah. Uh, thing. Okay, so this is uh, the exercise five, which yeah. is, uh, you know, um, it says to something very, um, it says uh, to just fit a logistic regression model that uses um, for, for the uh, data set, uh, uh, the, in the income uh, uh, data set, um, and then uh, like compare these these values uh, uh, under a different approach to see which one is uh, what is the level of the the test error, and the test error is so uh, as as you. Uh, mentioned it, Ricardo. So it's the error on the test set. So it's the margin of error on the test set compared to the, the, the error in the training set. So this, um, this exercise uh, basically takes uh, um, uh, a new, uh, uses a new um, distinct uh, new package, cut tools for um, the data. Um, and uh, you can load this data, which is default uh, from the, uh, <clears throat> from this uh, cut tools package. And uh, here you can see you have student balance and income. So basically you need to uh, use the default data set and uh, for making a linear model, a, li uh, not a, linear, a logistic regression, 
to predict the probability of default uh, using income and balance. Okay, so you are going to use uh, um, a GLM um, model for uh, predicting default uh, when income and balance are the two predictors. Um, okay, under these conditions, uh, the uh, <clears throat> so the the exercise uh, says to where is it? Okay, um, split the data in the training and set. So this is base R, but can be done with uh, uh, tidy models uh, and then uh, using a workflow. Okay, so for example, um, and then he said in particular to use a validation set. So I, uh, use it tidy models, uh, so we know how to use it. So I set the seed, as you, uh, as you said, because otherwise samples are different. So we have five minutes left. And then I split the data in training and test. Uh, and then I've created a validation uh, set. A validation set is basically taken from the training data so you split in training and test, then you take the training uh, test and split it again to obtain uh, with a validation split function to, uh, sorry, I didn't run this, to obtain again a first split this time of the training set so uh, that you can, um, you, you see you have 75% in training and 25% validation. He split the training again so that, that you can test your model into the validation set, which is a part of the training set. Okay. So for making this logistic regression, I use a, a logistic regression with an engine GLM. Uh, and then um, calculated the detail test error, uh, so I fit the model this way, where is it, um, mm -mm, okay, so I fit the model, um, and then predict new, new data set, on the test set um, and then mutate the test in true uh, and false. So we see this um, doing um, step by step. So for example, I fit the model and obtain this result and say that income um, it's very low uh, for for each uh, on average for each unit increase of uh, default. Then I predict this result and uh, it's a classification uh, problem. So I think yes or not. So if I go to default or, or yes or not, in case my income and balance uh, uh, for, for, for this income and balance data that I, I have, then I create a further uh, column, uh, which is the truth. Okay, this is for calculating the, the test uh, error. And um, the truth is what is, is, in, is in my data. Uh, so I can see the, the, the prediction result against my observed data, my truth. No? Uh, so, and to, to calculate the test error, I need to see the, the, 
uh, amount of uh, prediction which goes wrong, basically. So I consider it the accuracy. Uh, and I see that the estimate of the accuracy is 97%. And the my uh, and I have considered that if the, the the opposite of the accuracy is one minus the estimate. So nearly 3% is my error. Okay. So um, if we go and see uh, very quickly uh, this thing here. Okay. So this is the, um, the exercises. And he did it uh, um, with uh, uh, base R, saying uh, that uh, the uh, considering, instead of doing this, the things that I did with tidy models, considering uh, he made a, um, a table of the number of prediction which they release it no, and then and then yes, against the, uh, the 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 result of the test default. So the, the so the, the observed against the, the the predicted values. But with uh, base R, he basically needed to make a new. Uh, replication of the, the data with uh, this function, replicate, and then of the same length of the, the test set, uh, and then consider if this value are greater than five, uh, 50%, then name it yes, otherwise no. So he could consider it the, the, the amount in, instead of just having the class. And the test error is uh, 2.5 instead of 2.5. So I've searched on the internet. So now it's one past uh, six. So I stop sharing. And uh, uh, if you go and search on the internet, you find different results of this uh, same exercise, first part of the exercise, uh, but about that is the level of the uh, test error. It depends even by the uh, set the seed. So the, as the replication are different each times. So the, this is uh, all for me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Alrighty. See see you next week. Uh, next week. And, yeah, okay. Bye now. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.